Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the podcast. Today's guest is Getty Hill, the co-founder and CEO of GFX Labs. GFX Labs is a cryptocurrency product company. Getty, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So I guess before getting into GFX and all of that, uh, you and I first met in your prior role at Grapefruit Trading. And if I remember correctly, you actually dropped out of school to join their team or, or something along those lines. How did that come to be exactly? How did you wind up at a trading firm? Yeah, um, Eddie and I, my co-founder, both did not make it through school terribly long. We joined the trading firm summer of 2018. So I made it through one year of school. We happened to be falling down the crypto rabbit hole. We're doing a bunch of just all the sorts of degenerate fun things on all sorts of different chains, you know, the, the hype of 2017 and all. And through some folks happened to meet the folks who were starting Grapefruit Trading who had left um, Cumberland in Chicago and were starting their own. And we happened to like run into them through like, you're getting some co-working space. And the guy who was running the co-working space knew the guy who was starting the firm and was like, hey, these, these kids came in and they, they seem to know what they're talking about. Do you want to talk to them? And I guess we kind of impressed them. And they were like, all right, we'll go spend the summer working for these guys, you know, you know, in between years and, uh, you know, a summer turned into a year, then a year turned into three years. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. Well, that is a uh, incredible bit of happenstance there. So what was your initial role when you joined Grapefruit and how did that evolve over time? Yeah. So Grapefruit Trading was part of a larger traditional trading firm, not particularly too much larger, but it was like, you know, 20 people in the traditional side. The crypto desk was a singular desk. Um, and so it was just, it was just getting started. There was like the uh, a senior trader there with uh, like someone they had brought in with us, the actual like lead on the desk, who was also the owner of the firm. And then we had joined, um, when we were essentially just complete grunts, at the bottom of the chain there, tasked with initially building out the back office for actually like tracking all the stuff and redoing the existing back office and paperwork, exchange onboarding. This was also back during the ICO of like craze. So like looking into ICOs was definitely like a part of like the first three months, very quickly stopped doing a lot of that and just stick to Delta neutral trading, which was the kind of the rule on the desk was just Delta neutral based trades. But yeah, it was a lot of grunt work and just basic stuff, but you know, have to go learn all of it for the first like, kind of year. Totally. And then at some point, I think it must have evolved, or at least in your personal capacity, kind of evolved more into DeFi stuff. That's how you and I first met when Grapefruit was coming on as a borrower to TruFi. Uh, but where did that, was that just kind of you guys yeah, following the markets yeah, or how did that? Work? We, you know, the, the, the existing traders on the desk were trading uh, perps, BitMEX perks, et cetera, all sorts of stuff a lot. And they had their already were running their own uh, automated market making strategies on a couple of the, you know, the top exchanges and whatnot. And so in between us doing like necessary work, I had started to like learn a bit about what was going on in the DeFi world. And this was like MakerDAO was essentially the only thing back then and whatnot. And it compounded just coming online, dabbling these things before stable coins beyond MakerDAO existed. And then slowly over time, we're like, oh, this is kind of neat. And it went from being like, okay, we can actually make like, you know, our trading strategies more efficient because we can borrow capital like from compound instantaneously, or we can use it to like settle OTC trades faster because we can borrow this capital and that capital and, you know, use it during settlement processes. Uh, and then just slowly like scaling that. When I say slowly, I mean like I remember the pains of like 2018 and 19 like very well still. I feel like, and that was a very slow period of like of, of DeFi when it was just way way smaller. I'm sure you do as well. Um, and it wasn't in, like for a really long time until like when I'm trying to remember when did TrueFi actually like launch? Because I know we were there pretty early when it came to the Bahrain stuff, but the, the time does blur for me a bit. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been November of 2020. So just uh, about three years ago. Okay, right. Because yeah, Compound launched its craziness uh, in the comp token, and the yield farming stuff in May of 2020, right? So yeah, then that was, okay. So, yeah, it checks out. I and mean, I remember the good times of, over there of being like trying to explain to uh, the boss on the traditional side of the firm, being like, so I can go on the forum and I can ask them to lend us some money. And because people actually know who we are, like they'll just lend us capital. And he's like, why I, it was a long conversation trying to convince them to understand like what is occurring here on the traditional side of the firm they just did not get it yeah that was one of those things we're looking back at it there was really a period from like i guess with truefy november to maybe february where that was the case and then you know we started moving to a more kind of traditional underwriting yeah. but using small, on-chain software yeah. yeah right 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 but you guys were definitely in there for that and i agree looking back that was 
totally insane in in many respects but well, it's, it's, okay. I, I look back at our early usage at the trading firm of like compound as absurd i mean we used to represent a huge portion of like a capital on compound and you know looking back on our knowledge of what we understood that protocol like under the hood to be compared to like my knowledge of barland protocols today it was crazy we're doing that but i mean you know tis these things right i mean <laughs> it all it all worked out and then i can i can proudly say that in our three years of the trading firm we never once lost money in a hack, exploited contract, etc. We were like, uh, Eddie, my co-founder and I, were like ruthless about making sure this never happened because we knew the traditional side of the firm would like murder the crypto desk immediately if it ever happened. So we always had to be a little extra careful of what we did. Yeah, that's definitely a tough one to come back to if you have traditional partners on that. So were you guys, uh, you know, auditing or diligencing these things before you put capital in or what was that process at the time? I mean, eventually, I would say like, by the time, you know, the compound stuff was like, late 2018, what, 2019, like early 2019. By the time 2020 rolled around, we were pretty well versed in like smart contracts at that point. So like we, we had a very good understanding of like Compound V2 when that came out and et cetera. Like all, all that stuff was really just the early days when we were kind of in hindsight doing things not as well as we should have. By the time 2020 rolled around, even late 2019, we were working with some decent amount of capital on chain. Uh, and then particularly in 2020, once like the Compound comp tokens came out and you could do the looping trade and such, uh, then we were diligencing contracts and everything, things, and we had some strict inter internal rules that we set for ourselves about like how, when, and where we would deploy capital, et cetera. That makes sense. So uh, I guess, you know, at some point there, you branched out and decided to start GFX. Uh, I guess before kind of getting to that founding story though, you know, what was it things from, you know, I guess at the beginning of Grapefruit, you were working on more of the operational stuff as well, but what are things you've been able to take from Grapefruit as you've started GFX and some of those learnings? Yeah, the opportunity we had at Grapefruit was fantastic. Um, you, you know, you would think that running a trading firm and running like GFX Labs is fairly different. And I would say like there's, you know, the products are obviously different. Like, you know, the thesis is different in itself, but there's a lot that we carried over, especially from like when we started GFX in the sense that our boss over at Grapefruit Trading gave us a really like a huge um, breadth to operate in. It was really like, hey, like Delta neutral trades only, like, don't steal the money. <laughs> and it took a long time to earn his trust. Don't steal the money. Uh, if something does go wrong, tell me immediately. Well, essentially, he's like three rules. But otherwise, like your role here is to just like make money. And like, if you can't, you get cut. If you do, you'll be rewarded. And that was that. And the thing is like, those are such wide parameters. That was the same thing when we came to the startup. Okay, well, you have like capital in the door. We have our brains and we have money in a bank account. Like what can we do to generate more money essentially at a large scale? And so in that, that frame of mindset that we kept going through for two, three years in the trading desk, I would say like really largely applied to GFX and like still does and how we think about things. We think about things very literally, things like with like <laughs> probably more economically than most people. Uh, we really do like look at the actual details and build out models over here. And I constantly hear when, you know, we talk to other you know investors in the space and they're like, you know, you guys are thinking way overthinking this stuff. When I, you know, people think we're very commercial. I've been called commercial many times by folks because of our knowledge in the trading desk and like how we do things, but it taught us a lot of great lessons, I would say. Yeah. There's something very pure about uh, what your manager had said to you there. Just like make money, you get rewarded, don't make money, you get cut. There's something very pure about trading firms in that sense. Yeah. I mean, exactly. And what I remember in the early days when we joined the firm, we the, the, the main firm is based in Chicago. Uh, our desk was based in Miami. We eventually moved down to Miami to the office down there. And at one point, I remember one of the guys had asked the boss like one day, like, so like, what should we do? And he was like, well, if I knew what you should do, I wouldn't have hired you. And that was, that was, that was the answer. So I was like, okay, it's really just a blank slate of like, you can do anything as long as it has returns and you operate within this, you know, the three rules. And at, like at GFX, it's very much that same mentality of like, you just got to get it done. Like find ideas, try things. Like come up with a plan. If you want to change the plan the moment you've came up with the plan, great. But just like execute and like try to get that small one. A big thing in prop trading is like not trying to overbuild the strategy immediately. Like prove with as like small, as little effort as possible and capital as possible. Prove the idea and whatever you're trying to do. And then if you want to make it more efficient and automated, et cetera, like go for it. Uh, but like, that's definitely how we apply a, a lot of what we do over here. Yeah, I, I resonate with a lot of that. And I think I come at maybe from a different angle where, you know, you're coming from a prop, prop trading perspective. I'm coming from a perspective of having worked at a Silicon Valley company that raised a bunch of money in the past. And I feel like maybe the lessons you learned in the positive way, I learned in the negative way where 
you know, I think that there are a lot of excesses that come with being overfunded and not having that pure goal and mission of make money, which is just clean and simple. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I will say on the inverse of that, I'm sure there's a lot of lessons, but like um, Eddie and I would have learned if we'd come from a company that like was a larger scale company and like we didn't really know anything about building teams. I would say like that's one of the shortfalls like Eddie and I had when we started the company was like we didn't realize how long it would take for us to really build the team that we want to have and like what that looks like in that process. Uh, you know, we'd never hired people before and stuff like that. The ops of running a company. Oh my gosh, I did not appreciate the headache that and I, this is crazy. I mean, we did a ton of ops work, but it was all trading ops work. And even though I like for many years was stuck doing the tax work for our desk on the, uh, at the firm, you know, still the ops work of running a company is like one of those things that unless you, I feel like you've done it before, you just don't appreciate. Yeah. State by state filings and just so oh, many headaches. It's, it's yeah. ridiculous, but all right. Uh, on to the more fun stuff. So what was the initial kind of impetus or insight you had then to start GFX? Like, where yeah, so Eddie and I had been at the firm for, for three years. And like I said, this was like essentially our first job out of school. Um, that'd be like, you know, not a lot of school, but, uh, and so we had, 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 you know, as you can imagine at the DeFi year, had a pretty good year uh, and thought, you know, it was the appropriate time after doing a good stint at the firm to um, switch to building things rather than just trying to get a PL number move to move every single day. Um, and so we started GFX with like the core ethos of like Bell Labs and AT&T. And that's very much like still what we want to do and that, you know, they have this Goliath company that really is the the whole funding of the operation and what uh, and whatnot. And then you have the research and development side um, that is the really fun and interesting part that, you know, has all these awesome patents and is known for such historical and significant research. And so the hope was kind of that we could always build that AT&T and then develop, you know, great research and, and such and house and get bright minds to build other interesting things inside of crypto and out. We've kind of walked along that thesis, uh, I would say, since we started the company. Uh, it's a difficult one, I would say, until like you get to like a certain scale, um, but hopefully we get there eventually. Yeah, so I, I remember, and actually I'm doing this from memory, I think, so I might be wrong, but I, I remember when you guys launched, you had the Minecraft-like kind of gaming experience. Yeah. Poppy, uh, kind of like yeah, that. Yeah, Poppy, so the, the main, the yeah. flagship thing we were initially working on, this was like the big reason we had left the trading firm was, I wanted to build this, what now is very similar to what um, Gnosis is doing with Gnosis Pay and some mm. other cards that are on the market in Europe, but essentially like, okay, how can we allow the user to go down to the store, swipe their card at Target, whatever, for that matter, wherever they're making their purchase and use like ETH and Compound as collateral and use borrowed USDC to like pay for that transaction. And I was like super excited to build this. Uh, we had gotten Visa to put us in their fast track FinTech program to get it done. And that was kind of like, once we got their approval, that was like, okay, we can leave the trading firm. We can raise some capital on this uh, and work on building it. Geez, did I not even realize how complicated, even after having Visa, I was like, I thought once we had Visa stamp of approval, that'd be like smooth sailing. And it was like, gosh, without that stamp of approval, you'd be dead on arrival with it. You have like, oh, like, you know, 1% chance, probably less of like getting anything launched. It was, uh, we, we went through multiple iterations of trying to get that product launched and a lot of regulatory hurdles and eventually just decided to completely shelve it, which was very sad with a lot of money in the hole on that one, but you know. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like in terms of all of the difficult things you could have taken on, maybe only like a bank or centralized exchange has more complexity and you know real world touch points than something like that. Yeah, that's definitely one of those things where it's like a founder needs to have like some decent amount of ignorance to believe they can achieve something great. And that one was probably the place we overshot on. But it was it was a lot of fun building that product and we learned a ton. But yeah, and it, it does make me feel at least a little bit better that like even now today, like two, three years later, like folks still can't really build this product in the States. Uh, really, it's only viable in Europe and some other regions, which is a real shame. But I imagine it'll get done you know, in the States at some point. Maybe it'll even be us by then. Hopefully. Yeah. So I guess today, so GFX looks different than where it started a couple of years ago. So today, I mean, I kind of see you guys as wearing two big hats. There is the crypto product studio side where you have things like Oku, which we'll talk about later. And then there's the active governance contribution side. So how do you break up the team across these different things today? Does everyone do a bit of everything? Are people kind of segmented? What does that yeah, like? well, that, that's exactly right. So, you know, most people who have heard about GFX before is because of our role uh, in protocol governance, uh, either at Uniswap, where we've been a really um, significant player there for, for many years at this point, I guess the, the duration of the DAO, MakerDAO as well, Optimism, or one of the larger and more active delegates over there. 
uh, historically, of course, Compound. The funny part about the governance work that GFX does is it really is like a minority piece of the mind share over here. Uh, essentially, we have on our team, Paper and Pierre and Chris, who does most of the protocol governance work and represents GFX interests um, at MakerDAO and Optimism and Arbitrum. Otherwise, I manage the Uniswap delegation since that's kind of the one I had brought into the company initially um, and manage you know, the relationships there. Because that's, I mean, as I'm sure you're aware of, a lot of this stuff is all relationship based. It's, it's, you know, just literally very traditional politics, knowing what everyone's position on the board is and what they want, where they're going and trying to align incentives constantly on whatever, you know, new initiative or issue you're trying to, to get through. So in the grand scheme of things though, it's really just Chris and, and myself who spend the time on the governance stuff and then whatever extra protocol work needs to be done from there can kind of get done by either myself or one of Eddie or my, my co-founder or the, one of the Solidity uh, engineers on the team. So it's not that much in the grand scheme of things. It's mostly actually to your point, Oku are special projects um, and then other software development work that we do for hire for folks. Okay. I, I actually didn't realize that at all. So I, I guess that in terms of your kind of time split, it, it's actually very little on the governance side compared to yeah. all the other stuff you guys are doing. Yeah. I mean, at this point, because I really just manage the Uniswap stuff, you know, it does help on our team. And I don't think, I can't imagine there's really any other teams in the space that are like our size and what we do where they have like one full-time person who they only do protocol governance. So like that does alleviate a lot in the sense of like, I don't have to do all that. And I kind of just kind of trust Chris to do a lot of that well and, you know, keep an eye on what's going on over there. And of course you get involved from time to time on the larger votes, but yeah, otherwise maybe I spend five to 10% of my time in a given month working on Uniswap related things. Uh, the other thing that's a little difficult is like a lot of the delegation stuff that Chris works on are positions that are protocols that do have paid delegation. So this is a bit of like a still of a, weird issue that not many protocols have dealt with and that like maker actually pays a pretty decent amount for delegates um still uh actually pretty well uh, pretty yeah um but then optimism pays some as well arbitrum is talking about doing it um but uniswap still hasn't and we've done a lot of free work for uniswap over the years uh of course some of that you know as we'll talk about later maybe it helped us materialize oku a bit but yeah we've we've done a quite a spent a quite a few hours on, on uniswap <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, I guess there's maybe two kind of angles we could go there. One is, you know, I think there's definitely a discussion around where you said, obviously, a lot of things today are still not paid. And so the incentive for people to get involved either is they have a large kind of token holding and they want to make sure that's shepherded correctly, or just kind of a labor of love almost, you know, if, if yeah. you're not getting paid, there's, there's definitely just a lot of that that I think happens. I mean, that's, um, that's what it was at Uniswap for us is a big reason why we did Uniswap and these DAOs in the early days. And I like doing stuff at Compound was it was fun what other you know what other space or industry could someone who's just extremely young like ourselves relative to what you normally have to be be able to affect this much change on protocols that are responsible for this much money and you know flow uh that to me is just exciting so that being said i think that excitement does kind of like wear off over time we've done a lot at uniswap we've done like seven or eight successful proposals we've been a huge part of the multi-chain expansion uh we've done a ton at compound and such as well and we did a lot of it because we're not getting paid at the same like idea of, can we build a brand and whatnot as well? Can we get more people aware of GFX? And we kind of more or less topped out on that, I think at Uniswap, uh, there's not too much more we could do to get people aware of us, essentially everyone is at this point, uh, who's going to participate in protocol governance, you know, that is, so, yeah. So do you still look into getting active into new DAOs as well from a governance perspective? And I guess also, right, I mean, I've seen you do more ad hoc stuff like the infamous Ferrari. I don't yeah. know how long ago that was now, but like, how do you think about even one-off things like that? Yeah, um, we do. I mean, I think optimism, like a relative to our stack is the newest one. You know, it's not terribly new now. We're like in the I think going into the fourth season, season of governance over there. Um, Arbitrum, we've been dabbling in, you know, we, we hold a pretty minority position over there. Really for what it does, you know, for it is sort of, oh, can't talk. Really, for us uh, to get involved in new protocols, it typically comes from like the investors that we work with and the funds that we work with. So the funds that are familiar with us and delegate to us, be like, hey, you know, such and such things coming online. We have a position of it. Um, would you guys be interested in going over there and you know doing some governance work? At this point, generally the answer is no, uh, because really we have the position that wherever we participate, we want to be like really impactful, uh, and in order to do that, it just requires time. And at this point, between MakerDAO and Optimism uh, and some of the other stuff that Chris does, his time's mostly like fully allocated. And for myself, I'm just 
doing a bajillion things. So it's kind of tough. If a new protocol comes around and we have our eye on a few and like there's an opportunity that by all means, but we're, we're, we're fairly picky about where we, where we go, and where we spend our time. So one of the things you mentioned is just some of the investors and funds you work with can be a driving force there. I guess that is a byproduct of investors and funds themselves not being active in governance uh, in many cases, which to me, I guess, from a regulatory perspective is why they do that in many cases, but it's definitely, I think, a detriment to these protocols. You know, they it, are- it's, it's absolutely, it's a massive detriment to the protocols. Um, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, what we do for these funds, like, shouldn't really exist. Uh, the funds should be doing it themselves. And it's like constantly mind boggling to me that like they don't, particularly like, you know, funds that lead these rounds of various protocols and such, not getting more engaged in the protocol. And to your point, a lot of them do voice the opinion that it, you know, it's regulatory risk. That being said, I mean, by no means a lawyer or whatnot, but I certainly spent a lot of time in this space and heard a lot of lawyers talk about, it. I don't particularly know how much risk you're avoiding by not voting in protocols yet having invested it in whole of the tokens and having the ability to vote. So I, in my mind, it's, you know, get involved, help this thing grow. That's kind of your role as an investor. If you don't want to, next best thing is to delegate to folks like us. Uh, but beyond that, just to like sit out and be completely passive, I think is is a bit poor form. But I think you know the industry is improving in this fact, but it's extremely slow. Yeah, I I definitely agree, and I think most of the investor involvement we've seen have been more of these activist type campaigns, right? Uh, yeah, like Arca or I guess often Arca or kind of these RFV type of people. What do you think about the role some of those folks have played in the industry? Are those productive? Are they distracting? Where do you fall? I, I, I think they're net productive. I think it's good. Uh, I think it's good for these activist investors to get involved. Well, we've certainly talked with a number of them about various interesting initiatives. And in our conversations with them, you know, typically what it is, is like they're willing to tackle a sticky issue as long as they believe that sticky issue is going to result in like a positive outcome for like net token holders. It may be that some token holders are going to disagree with them, which is probably why that issue hasn't been breached yet. But like, by all means, if these guys are going to bring about what I believe is net positive change, then, then it's a good thing. Uh, I felt, you know, the existing token holders and funds don't want to step in and play their role as stewarding the protocol, then of course, someone else should be able to. That being said, like GFX Labs is very pro, you know, essentially shareholder rights, token holder rights. You know, if you have the token, and you got it fair and square, by all means, exercise that right however which way you wish. That's that dele to delegate to us, amazing. If it's that, you know, if you want to vote against us on our initiatives, okay too, like that's your right. I, you know, we might disagree on these things. We might voice those quite publicly, but hey, if you bought the token, you know, that's, that's your right to do so. Yeah, well, I think certainly somewhere where I've seen GFX uh, or paper, I guess, have disagreement uh, across kind of forums recently, at least over the past year has been Maker where there's yeah. obviously been a lot of change. Their governance is probably the furthest along of anything out there. You know, I think the level of sophistication or complexity, whichever way you want to frame that one, um, is leaps and bounds beyond everybody else. Where do you guys net out on the current state of Maker today? And I don't know if you're even allowed to talk about your involvement given the... Yeah, there's a weird set of rules there. We can talk about our involvement. Obviously, like all the delegates are Anon. Um, I think we're allowed to acknowledge that we exist as a delegate, just not which one we are. We'll see. Maybe Chris will pay me and I'll misunderstand the rules because to your point, the complexity is pretty deep there, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's fine. There's a lot to be done at MakerDAO to improve it. There's a lot of opportunity there. That's one of the places where I we, we want some folks to get more activated and interested. There's a lot that can be done there with some more token holders kind of coming together and stewarding some particular initiatives. Is there a bit of a mess there? Absolutely. That being said, Maker is a beast. And like on the net, the direction is very positive. Uh, the work that Spark has done has been extremely interesting. Uh, and I think very promising for the overall protocol, uh, particularly if you're an MKR holder. So in that sense, like, yeah, there's a lot of noise over there and the complexity is high, but like the direction is positive. Uh, the protocol is doing quite well relative to most Barland protocols, but they, 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 they certainly have a lot they could do to improve as well. Some folks want to get interested and get involved. So you, you mentioned Spark has done a lot there. In what respect? Just kind of in popular popularizing SDI yeah. or the, the subdown model kind of being the first to market there. I think this, this notion that MakerDAO is just a massive capital allocator and they have a, a huge amount of it was always known, but it hadn't really been in my mind properly exercised, at least not to the full potential that it has been in a recent time. Uh, and the idea that's like sparks like, oh, okay, well, we want to, you know, deliver die to markets in a different fashion and, you know, uh, expand a, a little bit faster. 
um, this Audio V3 code base is pretty good. How about we just copy paste that, give them a little bit of you know action on the side, and then we'll just infuse it with a credit line from MakerDAO. Amazing. I mean, the credit line's gone from $100 million to $800 million. The protocol's grown to be you know the top three or top two Barland protocols, not counting forced the parent there. That is something that I don't think many people, myself included, foresaw when Spark initially launched. Uh, I mean, I knew it was going to be successful. The ability to have that credit line is huge, but it, it's a game changer in the state of bar lend. And you know, this is coming from someone who's built a bar lend protocol and spends a lot of time of it. If I was a, if I was developing a new bar lend protocol today, I'd be kind of worried about what that looked like, or at least at the very least, I'd be trying to get MakerDAO to get in on it, so that way I got that credit line. That's a very challenging thing to do, but if you can pull it off, like you, it's essentially a kingmaker in this at this point. Yeah, actually. Around the time Spark was coming out, we had written a blog post on the, the Wallfacer blog about Spark. And actually going back on the Maker forums, Mario Conti had written about this concept of Maker Nation in the past. And it's basically the idea of, hey, Maker owns this central bank of DeFi, essentially. We should try to own every single vertical. And I think you're actually kind of seeing that across a lot of places, right? Ave tries to introduce a stable coin. Maker introduces... Uh, you know, money, more money market looking type of protocol. You know, I think in the past, they've talked about introducing their own liquid staking product as well. I think maybe they've scrapped that, but you do definitely see DeFi converging and everyone trying to own this entire stack. What do you guys kind of think about that? And is it informing any of, you know, your activities as well? I think in the, in the context of MakerDAO, it's just extremely, I don't really believe anyone other than has the power to really own the full stack. Uh, and I think it's just the nature of their capital power so significant that like they can do that. Um, for someone to compete with MakerDAO, they would have to be a new player than like the space is seen to come in and infuse a huge amount of capital, which it just, in my mind, is unlikely. So I think they could pull it off. I think it's just challenging. Aave is huge, but they they still don't have, you know, they're huge, but it's like <laughs> MakerDAO's ability to infuse capital is like three magnitudes larger or something. It just, it's uncomparable essentially. So in my mind, it makes a lot of sense for like protocols and new protocols to focus on their specific domain, getting it right. Um, and then aggregating the, pro the protocol and the experience into like a single interface. So kind of like the stuff we're doing at Oku, we're really trying to focus entirely on user interaction with DeFi and like, how do we make that as pretty as possible on the bar lens side of things, of course, with MakerDAO, that's like SummerFi, which is the, you know, the X Oasis folks um, or the, the rebrand. And then you have, you know, all the other various applications like InstaDAP. Like I think like that, that to me is what makes a lot more sense is how do you really allow someone else to focus on the protocol and someone else to focus on the front end and let the front end guys try to build the best user experience. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. So coming back, I guess, to some of your governance work uh, before moving on to, to Oku there. So like you mentioned, you've been involved with Uniswap since the very beginning. What was the initial, you know, thing that drew you to Uniswap and, you know, in the time, how have you kind of seen it develop and, and what are your thoughts on it today? I, I wish there was a really elegant answer to this. The reality was, is that we had, I think it was just around the time we were leaving the trading firm because I had started doing our compound governance stuff, like uh, personally, uh, a number of months prior to that. And essentially, like around when the comp token launch is when I started getting involved in compound governance. Along the way, I got to know like the, the funds over there, which are largely a, a lot of the same funds in Uniswap as well. And so once I kind of earned their trust, they were like, hey, you should come over to Uniswap as well and participate over there. We need good delegates and whatnot and such. Uh, and I was like, hey, if you set me up with the votes, like, why not? I'll be there. It's Uniswap. It's the king of DeFi, of course. And showed up over there, voted on some things. And then like nothing happened. Like there was like six months of like, or I forget what it was. I think it was about six months or so where there was just, like, no proposals at Uniswap. Now it's finally like, okay, let's find some low hanging fruit and just get like points on the board essentially. Uh, and that started by like upgrading the um, governor contract to the new version uh, from Alpha to Bravo, which was like super, you know, not that interesting at all, but just a low hanging fruit. And then going from there to doing the one bit proposal, which was probably at our time at Uniswap, probably still in like my history of making proposals, the most historical proposal, I would say. And then, you know, just many other from, you know, many others from there. But it was really just about like, hey, it's fun to participate in the king of DeFi. Why, why wouldn't you? I mean, stuff like making the one bit proposal had a huge uh, long term impact on DeFi while being a rather trivial thing in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And I guess across the board, I mean, how do you think about Uniswap governance today? I would say it is. 
probably the biggest you know native token on chain treasury i think at least yeah i would say so i mean i think it i always am hesitant to call it a treasury because we don't have anything in it other than uni <laughs> and in my mind like that doesn't really count as a treasury uh like and i would say this for any protocol like any protocol which its own tokens are in there it, it's just akin to issuing you know more shares in a company and diluting all the existing shareholders so I, it's not in my mind much of a treasury that being said you know it is it is the largest it has a huge voter base the distribution is quite significant to get any proposal passed is a non-trivial amount of work and i think like i had once went through and like tried to calculate what the, like the net man hours are for like a generic proposal and like you know okay what is everyone's time worth etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean any uniswap proposal has got to be worth like I don't know, somewhere between twenty-five to like fifty thousand dollars at a minimum. And that's like a basic proposal to go through because it just involves so many people and so many phone calls and such to do the most basic thing, which I think is generally a fine thing. Like proposal passing it in the context of Uniswap generally shouldn't be particularly easy. But yeah, it is a bit of a behemoth. And today, you know, the protocols changed a lot from a year ago. Uh the number of participants uh have certainly changed in it as well. The distribution's been changing, more student clubs, more kind of professional delegates entering into space, less participation from the upper like funds, I would say as well. And the types of things that folks are voting on, you know, a lot of the votes over the last several months have been about deploying Uniswap and new chains and such, and less about, you know, the actual underlying protocol. There's been, of course, a lot of debate around the fee switch, which, you know, we've tried to push, some others have tried to push as well, but unfortunately none of those have made it to an on-chain vote yet. So I, I want to talk about the fee switch in a second, but before I forget about it, you mentioned the point about Uniswap's treasury being entirely its native token. How do you even think about approaching diversification of a treasury that large at that scale into something else, right? I mean, is it you just look for private investors like other DAOs do? Is it some kind of more complex option strategy or LP strategy or? In, in my mind, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, we have Uniswap Labs, which is its own independent organization, but they're well-funded. And obviously with the new fee coming in uh, from them as well, they have capital to continue growing things. You have the Uniswap Foundation, which has got funded. So in a sense, like the Uniswap Foundation kind of did that diversification. They got funded with a new tranche of like $40 million worth of uni, largely has been traded already into stables for them. So like in that sense, okay, we funded an external organization in addition to labs that can exist for several years um, in, in, in complete a lot of good. You have stuff like what we're doing with Oak and we'll get to, which you know helps the protocol. So I think like in a sense, like there's actions that have already kind of diversified things beyond those actions. I think it's quite hard. I don't want to say hard, obviously it could be done. I don't think it makes sense to really at this point, see like, oh, we should try to sell a hundred million uni to some investors uh, to raise capital and such. In my mind, really the easy thing to do is turn on the fee switch and begin accruing income and take the route of, okay, let's build our own treasury by actually having an effective like business on chain. That, that to me is the initiative we've been trying to pass the most, and I think is the most important going into 24. Yes, let's use that as the perfect segue, which is, so I think you guys, I think there's been a few fee switch proposals in the past. I think yours was how long ago now, maybe? Yeah, nine? ours was the most recent. So there's, yeah. there's been three, uh, ours was the most recent, the one that I would say, you know, presented the, the fullest, the fullest proposal for the DAO to consider. Uh, we had some snapshot, you know, temp temperature checks to try to figure out what people were thinking and feeling around it as well. Yeah. And so I guess one, what was the kind of kick that made you guys decide to write that post? And yeah, let me go there. It was actually the opposite of a kick. So <laughs> the post had been a Google Doc for about eight months <laughs> uh, sitting in there. And this was, it had actually been discussed amongst uh, uh, several people. And essentially, whenever we go about to do anything on chain, you know, any type of governance proposal, you know, a Google Docs draft, and you share it with a few of my friendlies. And you're like, okay, what do you guys think about this? And I'm like, make some edits. Okay, this is good. Okay, we share with a few more friendlies. We share with a few more friendlies. Tally up the votes. Okay, do we have the votes? Okay. And really, like, we generally don't like to bring things to the forum unless we kind of know it's already a done deal. Uh, because it's just cleaner that way just cleaner that way to argue that on the forum is always messy and always painful. You know, try to try to not try to line the line off offline, I think is appropriate. That being said, we had tried to do that essentially for eight months and I knew we were about 10 million votes short. And I was like, okay, maybe I can find the last 10 million votes. Finally, if I post this online and like find some folks who, you know, we hadn't otherwise known chatting to discuss with for maybe an activist investor reaches out and says, Hey, 
we're waiting to be these last 10 million votes that you need, et cetera. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case, <laughs> but you know, we actually had a, a, a very large portion of votes that we needed necessary to get it through, just, just not quite enough. But yeah, it sat as a Google draft for a very long time. So as, as I recall it, most of the pushback was on regulatory and tax uncertainty. Yeah, essentially tax uncertainty was the stated reason uh, largely um, from the largest voters, which I can understand. I mean, it's a complicated one, uh, particularly if you're an extremely large token holder. Um, yeah. That being said, I think if you're a minority token holder, this is an important issue. Otherwise, kind of what's the point in my mind? Like, you know, not to be not to be too terribly candid, but truly at this point, we're you know, V3 has been live for about two and a half years. V4 is about to come online. Uniswap's market share has peaked. I think at this point, it's really only going to go one direction, unfortunately, but that's the nature of being the king is it's, it's hard to hold that position. And I think it will hold the position for a long time. The market share is humongous, but it's a, it's it was the appropriate time to turn on the fee switch. And I think today it still is the appropriate time to turn on the fee switch. I don't know. So it just it was just a complicated one. Well, I, two follow-ups there. So one, actually, do you have a hypothetical of if the fee switch had been enacted when you guys made the proposal, how much revenue would be generated by now? Do you have like a even ballpark or something? Oh, like I would. If you'd asked me before, I could have found the number. It's it, okay. in, in the forum post included um, capital projections. It, it, it was going to bring in substantial revenue. I mean, the Uniswap protocol has huge flows going through it. Uh, it was going to bring in quite substantial revenue. The plan initially, though, was to monetize only Polygon at first. And this is one of the ways we tried to make it more appetizing to folks. I, personally, I kind of wanted to just do it on Ethereum and get it on with, but you know, some folks were like, that was a little too aggressive. So we're going to just do it on Polygon first, see the economic effects on it for a few months. And then if it went to everyone's satisfaction, we would have done it on Ethereum. But yeah, I mean, the DAO, if you, well, I should bring up the forum post, don't get me wrong, but I mean, tens of millions of dollars a year, no problem. I think right. on like when we look back into like the bull market kind of time frame, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Right. And I think this is really now the time where we're maybe entering a market where there's going to be a lot more on-chain volume. No time like the present to just start bringing in those fees, especially in an environment where there is someone who is monetizing from the protocol. You know? Absolutely. Right. And that's it. I mean, in my mind, if Labs felt that it was the appropriate time to monetize it on their end, it is the appropriate time to monetize it for the protocol. Uh, frankly, I think it should have been reversed. I think the protocol should have you know, monetized before Labs had done theirs. That being said, I mean, it was inevitable for labs to do what they were going to do. Um, that's the reason why they have the evaluation that they have, of, of course. But yeah. Right. Well, I, I do have a question about order of operations there. But before I forget it, you mentioned the tax considerations. Ultimately, DAOs, I think, in many cases suffer from some tragedy of the commons type of thing. Whose job is it to figure this out? Because in broad terms, it is probably applicable to many protocols within DeFi that Uniswap having an answer to this would give a lot of other people confidence in turning on fees if they're debating the same thing yeah unfortunately like i don't have a great answer to that um we've done some of our own research into it um the uniswap foundation has been taking the lead in that research i know some of the larger funds involved in uniswap have have done their own research and i, I think it's a bit of a cop-out answer but it's essentially like the dow just needs to vote on it and then like we're going to find out what the irs feels i'm of the kind of stern opinion that what we've seen out of the current administration is that if they want to inflict pain on a project or an organization or a group, they can do so at their whim. Us trying to worry about how they're going to look at the taxing of Uniswap and the fee switch, I don't think is going to change that. If they were to want to go after the uni token holders, they're going to go after uni token holders. So in my mind, it's like there's not really a whole lot to worry about here anyways uh, for what it's worth. Like, And I think this is the part that really bothers me with, with folks is it's like, oh, well, Uniswap's a special snowflake. You know, um, every single other protocol out there is currently accruing fees. Uniswap's not. And everyone's like, well, it's different. Uniswap's so much bigger and such a, has a larger brand. Like, you know, MakerDAO is huge, generating also 100 million plus revenue a year. They used to have a large American presence and such. Yes, Ruben has worked hard to, you know, diversify the protocol and spread everything out. But, you know, the point being is if the government wants to make an example out of someone, there's more than a few people who can go do that. Compound, right? Heavy American times is, you know, as is, is well. You can just go down the list. It's Uniswap's not special in this regard. So I think really in my mind, the tax worries is not exactly the real issue. Interesting. 
what is the real issue then? It's, it's even lamer than that, unfortunately. I think it's just people will disagree about, should this thing be turned on at all? Essentially, the economic interests of the folks who hold the tokens, do they believe this even makes sense to be turned on in their interests? Now, if you're a smaller token holder and you hold your, you know, one ten thousand uni, you probably believe pretty wholeheartedly that it should be turned on. If you hold tens of million of uni, but you also hold tens, you know, 10% or something in a lab's equity, you might have a different opinion about, you know, how these things should be handled. And like I said before, this is where it's really, really important to emphasize as much as I make that point, which sounds a bit odd. We're very pro token holder rights. You own the token, you get to do whatever you want with it. But that doesn't mean that everyone else in the DAO needs to be led to believe that the fee switch is going to get turned on someday. So there's just a the balance there in my mind. Yeah, so that, that brings up two things. So one is, do you think that if you made the exact same post you did eight months ago today, that the public opinion would be any different, specifically in light of now the order of operations of labs has turned on fees ahead of the death? Do you think anything changes in people's thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that is, that will, the public opinion there has certainly changed and the participants have certainly changed. Uh, there are more participants in the Dow today who hold votes, who share the same opinion that it should be turned on. So it's actually something we've thought about bringing back up to the Dow. We've been extremely busy. And I know for a fact, there are other forces that are already working on this that are gonna bring probably a prettier proposal, even than you know, the, the, essentially the fourth generation Uniswap view switch proposal to the forums and the not so distant future. And so I, like, I think that'll be the fourth and final one. If that vote gets a great, if it doesn't, it's gonna hard to imagine that there'll be a fifth one after that. Wow. So I guess in your view, there's a lot riding on this, this fourth proposal. I mean, I can't be the only one who has the opinion that we've been around for almost three years and talking about this since before V3, how much more patience are folks going to have? I certainly know mine's pretty much worn thin. Um, so I, I think that being said, I'm very optimistic about the next iteration. So like, I don't want to sound too doom, doomsday. I, I, I generally think that actually will get approved. Okay. So on that then, you know, I think there is an ongoing thing, this discussion around uh, DeFi protocols and their labs entities, right? They're kind of founding entities and what that relationship looks like and evolves to over time. In your ideal scenario, say two years, three years, four years after the launch of a protocol, what kind of relationship does or should the labs company continue to have with the protocol? I think it depends on the protocol, you know, in the context of borrow lend where, you know, we have most of our expertise, I would say, after Uniswap. It's really important that that organization decides whether or not that that's the final version of the protocol and they want to continue to iterate on it. If they do, like that's a very clear place that they can, they can work on. If not, then like, okay, how do we distribute ownership to this, you know, to as many people as possible. And then like, essentially your, your core goal should just be to replace yourself with, with other folks. Um, and essentially, you know, whether that be your folks on the outside of your organization, but essentially disintegrate the labs organization, if you don't want to continue to innovate on the protocol. That being said, I think at this point in, the, you know, in DeFi, most people are interested in innovating on the protocol. And that's like a pretty core goal for that, that organization is, all right, well, version one's launched. What things did we learn? Okay, it's been live for six months. What do we need to do to make the better V2? And I think for now, like that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in, in my view, even though it didn't work out, I, I was always impressed with what Compound Labs tried to do with Compound Treasury, where to me, that almost felt like the purest version where, hey, we built this great protocol. We're not going to really take advantage of any sort of special privileges. We're going to try to build a business on top of it and deal with all of the challenges that come with it. I think in some sense, Uniswap Labs is maybe trying to do the same thing, but just the being the default UI, I think was tough for the, maybe the perception there. Yeah, exactly. I think this is Compound and Aave have the position of that, like there's actually quite a few other like clear UIs for them. People already built things on the, there was never really much of like a layer on top of Uniswap beyond trading. Uh, there still really isn't today, you know, some folks building tooling around LP and of course, and such, and, you know, protocols interact with it for other trading functionality, but it wasn't the same view of like compound really took to being like commercial to have other people come and build things. And then compounds take or trying to build compound treasury on it. It makes a lot of sense. And yeah, like I'm sure if the Uniswap folks listen to this, they'll be like, yeah, we're doing the exact same thing. I think it's just different because in the, the clear sense that compound had was monetized from day one. The comp token holders have a right to interest there. If they want to like extract it, they can. Whereas UniDAO's kind of just stall that a protocol that is great at 
moving capital around and being good for traders and LPs, but never really did much for the uni token holders. Yeah. Also, I mean, and I, I kind of see, I don't know, maybe compound V3 is kind of like the, the final iteration or the, in their view, a very good iteration. And it seems like most of the day-to-day -day work there is kind of, I don't want to say outsourced because that's not the right word, but like handed off to a gauntlet. I forget if they work with chaos, but I think maybe just gauntlet, like yeah, people gauntlet. who are kind of fine tuning the protocol into perpetuity. How do you see that space, kind of the risk management space within DeFi? Gauntlet, Chaos, I'm sure there's some others. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 going to grow in one. Uh, I think we need more participants here. I think we need more participants who are uh, properly incentivized to do a good job. Um, and we've seen some folks like into the block begin to try to enter it as well. And I like particularly like the idea of these organizations that are capital allocators who have large stakes in these protocols and are simultaneously trying to manage the risk in it. It's it's really important in my mind. This is essentially like at some point we're gonna kind of top out of in to some degree we're kind of there, but we're not, I don't think we're quite there yet on like what you can do with borrow land. And then it's just gonna come down to good risk management. And it's like the same way we have like in the traditional you know financial world, like banking rails are banking rails. What really makes a good investment bank or otherwise is the people managing the risk. And that to me is like the thing that we haven't really found yet. There hasn't been a great way in borrow land protocols for risk managers to be professionalized uh, and really get compensated well for their activity. And like, I think the only way that's really gonna happen is when we essentially have like more or less professionally managed like instances of borrow land protocols, which is kind of not possible, at least in the States right now underneath the current regulatory regime. regime. But I mean, I imagine abroad will happen like very soon and those things will be really interesting. And then they'll be calling MakerDAO for the credit line and then it'll just be wild. So could you explain that a little bit more just in terms of the actively managed piece? Yeah, I mean, essentially, what do we believe to be able to give, you know, a more effective economical market for borrowers and lenders? Aave or Compound and their token holders constantly trying to vote on these things and manage them uh, from the forums? Or can we actually get like a solid team of analysts and managers in a room and who have real risk management experience, granted DeFi is different, but you know, eventually the same, the same idea and be like, okay, like you have this capital manager in this bar land protocol, here's how the protocol works, but it's up to you to actually manage the risk here and expand this thing. Um, Cause to date really, if you look at Aave, Compound, MakerDAO, they've all been built and run by devs for the most part. Yeah, some of them have some, you know, uh, traditional uh, financial folks in their teams as whatnot as well, but I mean, not to the same extent that I kind of dream as we'll eventually get to is you know, the, the risk management key is the, the most interesting part. Do you imagine these will be like crypto native startups like Gauntlet and Chaos or is it more like S&P who also is starting to do more reports and they just their stablecoin thing recently? I imagine it'll be both. I bet, you know, the, the former is what it'll initially be. Um, you know, I think it'd be like really interesting if like someday Chaos or a Chaos or Gauntlet like company, one of them or a new one was like, all right, instead of servicing Barland protocols, we're just going to make our own and manage the risk here and do it better than everyone else. Which in my mind is like, if you are that risk manager and you have that conviction in yourself, incredibly impressive because uh, that's really you putting your, your money where your mouth is at like the most maximum uh, extent. But that's actually know. something I've, I've thought about as well, which is, you know, whether there's a lot of people who, for example, are expert kind of service providers and different things, whether it's like in... L2 beat as experts on L2s or a gauntlet as experts on risk management, where it's like, well, if gauntlet launched a borrow lend protocol, it would probably be fine tuned to all the things they've seen across every single one they've looked at and probably be a pretty great protocol, but you do cannibalize your main business in that same time. Exactly. As well, you like yeah. You cannibalize uh, your existing service contracts in hopes of you truly being able to be better than all the, all the status quo, which the other half of a bar land protocol is capital. So you have to have actually risk to manage in the first place. Uh, Correct. You know, that, that's, that's a non-trivial, that's probably even you know, harder than the, the risk management is getting the capital initially. Okay, so before moving on to Oku, which I'm excited to talk about, just to wrap up bar or lend here a bit, what else are you seeing that's kind of exciting, new, interesting across the space? Uh, the thing that I've been looking for and keeping an eye on for a few projects is cross-chain bar land. We're in a world where we have a new EVM every week. Uh, the number of L2s of the ZK flavor, of the Optimism flavor, et cetera, are quite large. And the new L1s that are coming out that are EVM. I am really looking forward to seeing who does a good job at cross-chain 
bar land for DBM. I've personally written some stuff on it that I really wanted GFX to go and build and maybe even be like IPv2, but we just don't have the, the resources over here to make that happen right now. But that in my mind is like the next big level up uh, for, for bar land is really doing a great job across chain. Okay. All right, maybe we'll come back to that, but let's uh, hop over to Oku for a second. So what is Oku Trade? Maybe just for people who aren't yeah. familiar. Uh, Oku Trade is an advanced trading interface for Uniswap V3. Uh, we're live across eight chains a day. We'll be on 14 by the end of January. And we really are just trying to be the cleanest, best user experience for Uniswap V3 and eventually any type of DEX trading that you're interested in doing. We're always going to be Uniswap V3 oriented. Uh, but we really just want to provide a great user experience for swapping any type of ERC-20 to any ERC-20 on any chain that you're on. So on the cross-chain piece, do you use something under the hood to, or you mentioned you're on eight chains going to 14. Yeah, we're not. Do you have some kind of under right the hood? Now. We're just oh, okay, deployed, yeah. So we okay. will, like, so today um, everything is Uniswap V3 oriented. We're just using the Uniswap uh, universal router. We're in the process of adding aggregators to every single chain and eventually we'll take the opinion of being a bit of a, meta aggregators so that way folks, regardless of the chain they're on, regardless of the available liquidity and user swap, will be able to serve them the best price. That being said, we are of the opinion that the best protocol to be an LP in is Uniswap. And so the, the interface will always be geared towards those pools and that liquidity provider information. Cross-chain bidging is on the roadmap, on off ramping is on the roadmap, doing a better job at managing users' portfolio and their multi-chain portfolios on the roadmap. We have a ton of stuff. We're really just hell bent and doing like really great front end work and really great user experience work that I feel like has been neglected. And the large reason why folks continue to use Coinbase and Binance and centralized exchanges is the UX is just better on those still than DeFi. But we can recreate all that here. So we're just working on it. So when you talk about those advanced features, do you, you allow people to set different order types on Oku, I presume? Do you... Yeah. So Are like today, on margin, for example, or yeah, I mean, like that's one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested about cross chain bar lend is, yeah. like I said, we're doing 14 different EVMs by the end of January. The largest application in crypto today is trading. The second largest is bar lend, and that's because people want margin on, on on their trading. So you know, how do we expand into that domain eventually? That's a further out question, probably like a Q2, Q3 question for us, but it's like definitely in, in, in the mind. So we'll see, there's a lot of things that we want to do, but essentially, you know, we can integrate and build whatever we want. The whole idea is, is like, there are things that we build from the ground up in the organization. For the most part though, we want to find folks who are doing a great job building aggregators, on off ramp inf infrastructure, bridging infrastructure, all that, and just bring their APIs into one single fluid interface. That way the user has one single holistic experience of, instead of having to go to 12 different websites to do anything in DeFi or anything cross chain. So is the, yeah, I guess the ultimate vision there is kind of this, you know, I think people used to throw around the term Prem broker or whatever, but you know, some kind of one-stop shop for all of your DeFi needs and, you know, getting the most out of Uniswap as well, because you have all these other things connected to it. Exactly. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have underutilized Uniswap V3 uh, to the same extent, like really like they didn't really understand how the protocol worked, what they could build on top of it. Today, really not many interesting things have. Some folks have built option protocols. That's kind of the greatest extent on it. Excuse me. We've worked on some pretty neat stuff on V3 that'll be coming live uh, in a few weeks uh, that I think folks will be really excited by. Um, that'll be partially OCO, partially with another, another company in the industry. Otherwise, yeah, like we really just want to build great UX. That's really what it's all about. We're hell bent on doing it. I'm going to just keep repeating it. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Well, so I guess kind of coming back around. So earlier you mentioned a lot of your Uniswap's work started as this labor of love. And I guess in some way that ultimately wound up to, I think you guys getting the biggest grant from the Uniswap Foundation to date. How did that come about? Did you pitch them on this? Were they looking for someone to do this and you were the perfect fit or? Yeah, yeah. So we, I think... As far as I know, we are the largest grant. It was, it was a $1.6 million grant that was, you know, spent across two initiatives, the front end that is Oku and then the back end that is the Uniswap V3 API, which, right. you know, for however good you think the front end is, the back end is even more impressive uh, of what we really built there. To be able to index the chain the way we have on any EVM and provide it really performantly to folks is just fantastic for developers. And we offer all that for free. But yeah, you know, how that process went down is the Uniswap Foundation was, you know, I guess the grants program at Uniswap was transitioning to the Uniswap Foundation. They had a pitch that they had posted out on the forums and Ken, who was running the grants, <clears throat> the grants program at the time, reached out to me and he was like, hey, we're thinking about doing this thing. Like, what do you think about it? Um, and I was like, okay, 
foundation sounds great. We definitely need more people who will care about the protocol. But like, what do you guys want to fund? Uh, like, what's actually you're asking for this capital? What do you what do you want to do? You have these initiatives and such, but how do you actually want to affect change? And he's like, What do you think we should do? Okay, I'll, I'll call you back in a week with some ideas. And so I did. And one of the three ideas we presented to them was like, Hey, how do we build an advanced trading interface to get people off of at the time FTX and Binance and come on to the DeFi alternative? This will be a new total ground up front end very different than the existing Uniswap experience for folks. And while we're at it, we'll solve this data problem that you need because in order for us to build a front end, we have to solve the data problem as well. So it was like a perfect match, I would say. You know, they know that we've spent a ton of time in the protocol prior to that and that we're very aligned with the being large delegates. You know, it was it was a very good alignment issue. It was also a good time for the company. Like we kind of needed a bit more uh, funding in the door. And so we were willing to do it probably pretty damn close to cost in the grand scheme of things, rather than really having to be a moneymaker for us at all. And just, you know, we're willing to throw a ton of resources at it over the last year plus. Two follow-ups from that. So one, you mentioned this was one of three ideas. I'm curious what the other two ideas were. That's a great question. I would have to go back in the chat, I think, and see. I know there were like, there was three clear ideas. Unfortunately, I don't really think I could tell you what the other two are off the top of my head. Hmm. Uh, it, it was over a year and a half ago at this point so okay well uh, maybe listeners will see find a, another opportunity in there for some kind of grant the second piece you mentioned then is about you know doing this basically at cost uh maybe you're not thinking about generating revenue today or or kind of building a financial business around this but how do you think about that longer term where do you see the avenues for monetization yeah i mean i will say for what it's worth i don't think the intention was for us to do it at cost <laughs> so there was a bit of a markup in there and it was just like wait the thing we've promised here is actually like huge <laughs> many many um, such cases <laughs> yeah exactly and we you know we'd already we did a pretty good job budgeting it overall i would say but we also i would say about four months in development through the whole thing it went from being like a fun idea to build this thing and like an interesting thing we were going to deliver to them to like oh crap this is actually like way better than we'd ever anticipated like the thing we put on paper and we designed in figma now is actually like real and usable and this is actually like pretty awesome. And so there was a bit of an aha moment where like, okay, now we should even dump like more resources into like making this reality and make it, you know, the best it possibly could be. As far as like the, you know, the business behind it and whatnot, you know, a lot of folks have asked me if we tend to do a token, the, the answer is the answer's no. Uh, we're just going to run this as a traditional business. As far as today, there really isn't, you know, there are no fees in the front end and such. Like we aren't making money from users in the front end. Uh, really, it's just offered at a cost of folks. What we have been doing, which isn't really a revenue model, but has been helpful is, you know, some of the chains that come on that we support, you know, they'll cover some of the integration costs and maintenance costs there, which, you know, we're never going to build a big startup off of that, but it does help cut away at, you know, burn over here, et cetera. Uh, but I think down the line, like every product that's ever gotten users to come trade on it has found a way to monetize it appropriately in a way in which users will be content with it. So I think like, we'll get there. I very much want to avoid um, charging fees on swaps. That's obviously like the clearest one that has been done today by folks. Uh, I think there's a lot of other more innovative, interesting things that can be done. But yeah, for now, it's something that we're kicking a can on for at least another six months or so. So I agree that, you know, basically any product that has a lot of users eventually figures out how to make money. Just, uh, you know, once you have the scale there. So to nerd out a bit, I mean, how do you think about the go-to-market of actually attracting users to this product? I know we've talked about this in the past, how, you know, difficult attention can be, but have you guys thought about that so far? Yeah, we have spent uh, a considerable amount of time, particularly like once we launched this thing, I shifted a ton of my time to like <clears throat> making sure we got this thing out the door and built to being like, all right, like me and my marketing guy on the team, Malcolm, we're going to spend a lot of time together trying everything underneath the sun, collecting as much data as we can, because this is really like my almost trading habits coming back and okay, how many dollars are we spending for user acquired here and such uh, and for exposure and just trying a lot of different things. And I think at this point, we can pretty fairly say that we're doing more marketing than like any, you know, DeFi project launched right now, maybe with the exception of like a few handful, at least as far as where we're being experimental. Um, we were on paid ads across a number of platforms. We thought of, uh, we're across all the you know, Web3 platforms. We're doing a lot of the analytics and data side of this as well to like really track all this in a, in a clever way. So we have a lot of work to do still, and there's a lot of fun things to test out. We've recently been doing uh, rabbit hole questing campaigns for, for folks listening that want to go and try it Oku and get some rewards for it. They can go on rabbit hole and try that out. We've been leveraging our you know awesome Uniswap V3 API to figure out you know which users should we be targeting or like what cohorts we can be doing. So. We're trying to approach it very, very methodically and, you know, perhaps too traditionally what you know, some might say, but I think it makes a lot of sense. 
No, I mean, if anything, I think crypto kind of lacks the, some of these things that I feel like in crypto we try to recreate are just studied. They're like disciplines in web two where, you know, paid advertising is a science almost. And so have you guys been using very traditional channels like Google and Twitter ads or more crypto native page channels? Google, Twitter, Reddit, mm. Brave, all those we're running paid ads on right now. Uh, you know, we're not spending the walls. That's the other thing. I mean, yeah. anyone who knows us, like. We didn't raise a bajillion dollars, but once upon a time when we started the company two and a half years ago, we raised two and a half million. We've long since spent well more than two and a half million. And we're here today with the 15 person team and a decent burn. Like we have to find ways to be economical. So it's a strong balance of like, okay, we're not going to go pay bankless $65,000 for a media blitz or more. Uh, that's, that doesn't make sense. These things don't work out. What can we do with $10,000 a month? What can we do with $20,000 a month? Uh, even those for us are a lot more than we've ever spent on marketing. But, you know, once you can track the stuff and make it make, you know, once you can prove the results and it becomes a bit more, uh, you can stomach it a bit more. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how with future versions of Uniswap coming out? How do you think about building for future releases? I imagine that you're getting information on a public timeline, but you know, maybe not, maybe you, you get kind of a heads up on some of these things, but how do you think about trying to integrate new features and such? We don't have a robust plan to integrate V4 right now. Uh, that's mostly because we kind of plan everything right now for like two months out. That's kind of the extent of like real, like what's actually going to get built in the next two months is more or less always planned out. And then it's kind of the third, fourth month, which is like, what exactly is the priority from there? Because a lot of the features and stuff that we build on the like larger scale takes about a month or something to do. V4 has been perpetually three, four months away from us. So it's never been like, okay, what, once like Gorelli test sets actually scheduled, then like it becomes a real thing. And then we'll actually start planning for it and figuring out what we're going to do there. Um, the V4 rollout's largely unplanned from my point of view. Um, I'm sure Uniswap Labs have some stuff that they've internally done that hasn't really been expressed to the public. Uh, or at least not to me. Beyond that, yeah, I think there's like a lot up in the air still. And then, you know, large part for the same reason that I just gave, that it's hard to kind of plan for a thing that's perpetually four months away. Um, that being said, I think it's finally actually four months away. Like I actually do think we'll begin to see this thing in uh, March or April sometime, but we still have a few more weeks for, you know, the Dencoon stuff to get scheduled. So, you know, related to that, I guess one of the things... And if I'm just kind of going from memory here on Uniswap V4, one of the features or pieces I keep coming across, or it's actually Uniswap X, so it's not even Uniswap V4, but it's Uniswap X, which has an off-chain aspect basically to how these orders can get routed if you go through the Uniswap Labs UI. Am I, am I saying that correctly? Yep, yep. How do you think about that then kind of comparing to Oakley? Like, do you guys wind up having to think about building your own kind of off-chain router as well? If if the Uniswap X volume, can, that can only happen through the labs interface or how do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why we, prior to them doing that, we hadn't really given a significant thought or I could say the opposite. I kind of turned away the idea of integrating aggregators in the interface. I wanted to be an opinionated Uniswap interface. I thought that made sense, particularly because of the grant money we received. With labs kind of giving the nod that they're moving away from that to be competitive, um, in my mind was like, okay, well, as much as it like, it'd be nice to be on the high horse and like continue to be an opinionated front end, that's not going to pay the bills or grow the interface and grow Uniswap. Um, the reality is, is like, we have to integrate other sources of liquidity in this talk for the best experience. And we can still push Uniswap out to folks. We can still go to new chains and deploy it, but we also have to like be realistic that folks want to know they're getting the best price. Folks that know, want to know they're getting protected from Ev and stuff. These are at this point, important features uh, to users. We have to find a way to deliver those to them in a, in a good balance. So that's why like we're integrating aggregators right now. There'll be aggregators rolling into the interface, you know, in a few weeks from now, and then we're just going to keep adding them. Cause that's kind of at this point, the last major feature that Oku doesn't have. We kind of really have everything else that's, I would fall in the requirement category. Uh, aggregator is kind of the last one for our chains. And then after that, then it becomes in the fun category of, okay, bridging would be nice. Portfolio would be nice. Off-chain, uh, uh, on-ramping and off-ramping would be nice and such. But those are like nice to have. Less, I would say like the aggregator is a requirement at this day and age. I, I love your practical approach and mindset to a lot of these things. Something you brought up, I, I guess, is that you guys have raised venture money in the past. I'm curious if there's maybe people who are considering venture or trying to get grants or whatever. What's been your experience working with the two different parties, working with VCs worth first working with say a grants foundation and 
the ongoing you know, of each. While we did raise in the past, it wasn't traditional venture. So I actually okay. really haven't had the proper like raised fund from proper VCs experience before. When we left the trading firm, we had done kind of our own angel round amongst a bunch of people that were at the trading firm, the other seniors on the desk, the firm itself, a bunch of people in crypto that we had known that knew and like trust us and what we were going to go do. And then some other like friends and family along there. So we essentially like syndicated a whole round without actually having a lead. And so today we've kind of been able to operate with more or less impunity, which I'm certain in some aspects has been good and others not good. I think in the grand scheme of things, it's gone actually like very well and probably much better than if we had had a, had had a VC on us. Like most VCs that I've talked with and know that like we do software development work for hire and such hated it when we went to go raise before and whatnot, you know, the idea that you guys do anything else than a single product, awful. Like how could you run a functional company? Almost all of their companies are out of business now. Like, <laughs> like we're the only ones who actually have to pay a tax bill at the end of the year because we made money. Uh, like it, it, yes, it's not fun that we have to spend, you know, 30, 40% of our time doing work that we don't aren't particularly invested in, but you know, it builds a team, grows the team, funds the business. Um, so I, I'm very excited for when there are more rational investors in this space. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's coming for a while longer, but we'll continue to do what we do and be different than the rest of them. Definitely resonate that with that. Uh, I think we have a very similar type of vein at Wallfacer where we definitely do work for other people as well. But, you know, I think similar to you guys, we try to build more and more stuff in house and, you know, but I agree that from a venture perspective, that business is tough to fund, right? It just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit into a clean box, but. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the funniest yeah. thing is I've talked with investors from, you know, the, the leading names in the industry, because we're friends with all of them through all of our governance work. Like you guys made X last year, you probably made more money than all of our porticos. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. I'm like, we're not doing anything crazy revolutionary over here. And it's not like it takes that much time. And then like, okay, the year has been paid for. Now we move on and we get to do the stuff that we really want to do. And yeah, so we'll see. I mean, that being said, I really do want to get to a point where we kind of can almost wholly focus on Oku. We've been working towards that over the last several months. Uh, we'll probably hopefully get there eventually, but the contract work does pay the bills. Totally, totally understand that. Uh, so I guess to wrap up on Oku, so what are your key metrics for monitoring success? And like, what's the ideal next 12 months look like for you guys? I mean, the next 12 months, when you like really say, okay, what, where are we at by next December? It's really at that point, like about volume, like what volume is going, truly going through the interface and what is the magnitude of that volume? And then what is the rate of growth on that volume? We took the approach for the first kind of three months of the launch that was really all about wallet connects and interface. Our interface doesn't really require you to connect the wallet until you literally want to do something. And so it was like essentially the equivalent of almost like a, like a user sign, but like the last second, you know, uh, and we figured, okay, yes, we can easily track how many people go to the site, but I want to know how many people like take action on it. And of course we're tracking swap volume and all that as well. But that was like the nice middle ground of, you know, in the first three months, folks aren't just going to show up and start swapping aggressively, you know, unless there's some extremely strong reason to do so, which, you know, we didn't particularly have, we're just a, a Uniswap interface. So anyone doing it would be like doing it purely because they thought the interface was better. So Wallet Connects, we've gone into the stage now, volume has become the priority, which I think kind of shows the maturity in the application. And then really it'll just be volume from here on out. Makes sense. I respect that you guys don't make the Wallet Connect happen upfront. That is the worst it's DAP awful. experience. Awesome. The new thing we're doing, and this is just a really quick tangent. The new thing that I've been just really annoyed by of all DeFi apps is that they make you go to a landing page and click open app every single time. Yeah. No one reads these landing pages. I don't read these landing pages. So in the next like month, we'll be doing away with ours uh, and putting up a new landing page that essentially is just like you straight into the application instead, but without being like too aggressive about it. essentially trying to balance that line. You will learn what Oku is without actually feeling like you're just on a landing page boards. That's kind of funny. We're, we're building something new right now as well. And I was just working on the landing page the other day and I was going through all of these web two websites that, you know, again, I, I think it's so much better to learn from them than from crypto sites, but I think that the, the landing page, it's just like no scroll, right? Give me the short message at the very top, but some of them just scroll for pages and pages and pages. All right. No one's reading that part, but no one's I'll reading. also, I'll, I'll, I'll also yeah. take your feedback there. Maybe just go right to the app. Maybe that's the way to go. I'm that, so what we're doing is we're essentially saying like the app is the trading page right now for us and the swap page. It's going to be like, we've taken a lot of inspiration from like when you land on Yahoo Finance or Google Finance, that mm. there's useful information there while also not necessarily being the exact stock that you're looking for, the exact equity you're looking for, et cetera. Um, you know, how do we have the 
almost catered analytics interface that is also a bit of like trading like so that way anything you click will take you to a page for you to trade essentially it's like one big you know come trade with us button without actually like having those buttons in front of the user and making it look bad nice nice so just recently you tweeted oku won't ever do points if you're going to do a token do one but don't pretend to do one where's your thinking on points not a fan i presume I, I think there's a time and a place for them. Airlines have found that. Uh, crypto has not. <laughs> like, essentially, I, I just, there's so many projects over the last several months who have been teasing their users with the idea of points to farm, you know, user accounts, you know, essentially for seemingly no reason who I'm sure some will issue a token eventually, but I don't think, you know, I don't think many will. I think in fact, it's a lot of projects who, or on their like deathbed, who are trying to show some last bit of user numbers in the door to get some capital in. And if they aren't able to get some capital, and then it just is it, they'll close it down. And, you know, that'll be that. What are the users going to be mad about when the whole thing goes flop? It's a bit of a harsh opinion, but I do think it's the reality for a lot of these projects. Interesting. Uh, I won't make you call out any of those deathbed projects, though I would be curious for an example, if, if you're feeling so spicy. No, I'm all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I guess... I'll give the counter of maybe how I was thinking about points, which is I think the scary thing about a token is that in general, once you launch it, it exists forever. And it's not like you can just wind it down or kind of go home. This token is going to exist forever. Points to me are almost like you can get a test run to see if there's any interest at all. And there's no downside to not paying people, you know, any kind of value for their points. Whereas with the token, it's like, okay, now I just signed up to service this thing for the rest of my life. So that would yeah, I, I be think the, that, I the counter. I think that's very fair. I, I really don't have a problem with them as long as they like do something at some point. Yeah. Like the one that's really interesting to me is like layer three particularly. And this is not me calling them out as a company that's about to flow. It's just you know, the, the largest points farm essentially that in existence right now account for a huge percentage of on-chain activity across all the new L2s and side chains. Uh, and users go there to farm XP and such. Uh, and I imagine it's in large prospect of hoping that these things will eventually like, you know, have an airdrop or the projects themselves that they're, you know, doing it with will do airdrops corresponding to these you know, XP points and such. And like, there's a, is a, there's a great purpose for those projects. I mean, we're using rabbit hole after all, um, and such, but at the same time, I do kind of wonder, like we've spent a lot of time, at least with Oku over the last few months, we went from being like, okay, acquire users, acquire users, acquire users for the first few months. We're like, wait a second. What are the users are we acquiring? What are the quality these users were acquiring? Um, like we have a huge number of wallet connects on our platform, but how many of these wallets actually have a thousand dollars in them? How many wallets actually have ten thousand dollars in them essentially? And like I think the point stuff just kind of gets gets it real messy real fast. I don't I don't need a whole click farm coming onto the site, you know, perpetually because they think ZK Sync is gonna get them some airdrop based off of Oku usage. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, I guess from your perspective, it can kind of conflate some of your metrics and yeah i mean we definitely spent we have to spend time and effort to like clean our metrics so that we're like wait what is real usage here and what is people thinking they're getting a token from zk sync because they did a trade on oku and like and such and you know other things so i think like yeah and i, I just can't imagine like in the long run like how many users are going to get burned and be like oh we did all this stuff we spent all this gas money and then like we never got anything in return like i, I just don't feel like it's a great introduction to to crypto and to DeFi for folks in the long run yeah it, maybe it's maybe it's too harsh, but all right. Well, I guess as we're kind of coming to the end here, one other question to come back to optimism for a second is: you guys are large delegates there. Recent retro public goods funding three. I always get the letters wrong. Round definitely seems to have brought a lot of controversy, just in terms of companies that have raised venture capital getting uh, OP rewards, smaller companies not, et cetera, et cetera. What's your kind of recap on the last round and? Do you think it's effective as it is today? This is a tough question. I, you know, I will clarify that the, you know, j just for listeners that in optimism, there are like two sides of governance. There is the citizen's house and the token's house. We don't sit in the uh, citizen's house. We only sit in the token house. Um, so we don't actually have a vote uh, on the retro program. For what it's worth, very happy to not have a vote over there. All these folks who had to make these decisions were all unpaid. And there were over 600 submissions for retroactive funding, which... You know, we sit in the grants community at Optimism. Uh, Chris does a lot of the due diligence over there. That's thankfully funded, but he has to review a huge number of applications when grants come in. Uh, I just can't imagine the burden that kind of goes into that process for these folks. I, I hope there will be reform in the program going forward for 
what it looks like to be a, a citizen and, and what is expected of them in that process. Uh, yep. As far as the opinions of like who should and shouldn't get funded, I think it's 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 nice that there's kind of like a civil debate around it. For the most part, is as long as it kind of remains civil. Uh, and I think it's always with retroactive funding going to be a bit of like the the pick me game, and that's just kind of like the the nature of it. That being said, like the concept of retroactive funding, I think. It, it's good it's just the challenge of executing it the challenge of executing it is just very hard i think and on the net like is the program successful we'll see in, in a few years i would say a lot of the folks who requested money are good projects there's also a number that probably don't really need money or like we've always had the strong stance and perhaps we're biased here that you know if for any grants program writing grants that are you know, on the smaller side, tend to not really affect real change in a DAO or a project or a protocol. And so, you know, as you would imagine, in order to affect big change, you kind of have to write those larger checks, uh, kind of like the one that, you know, we had with Oku is extremely large, but, you know, checks in the uh, upper 50 grand or 100 grand, maybe you'll actually begin to like achieve something, but to kind of just give out a lot of grants that are a few thousand dollars here and there, I'm not saying that's what the program is, but just in general for grants programs, we haven't seen, I feel like as an industry, a lot of success in those. Yeah. I Maybe this is my more capitalist mindset, but definitely just on its face, the retro public actives, retro public goods, whatever, retro PGF funding is an odd concept to me. And I was actually just at a, a wedding in my hometown last weekend. And I was explaining to my friend, because we, we received uh, a grant for vaults in this current round. Don't know how much it is yet, but I was explaining this to my friend who runs his family's tow truck business. And the concept of just like, yeah, you know, we kind of failed out this application. It's a little bit fuzzy in some cases, but you know, we're going to kind of get this grant for doing stuff in the past. It's a very foreign concept to anyone who kind of hears it. But I would say at least from my seat, even though the grant we get will probably be on the smaller side, it still does make me actually think about like, okay, what can we, what can we do more for optimism or base or things in the optimist community in the future? Since, you know, almost like just classic Robert Cialdini persuasion type of thing, you know, you do something for someone, they're more inclined to do something for I, you. I think, that, I, I think that's absolutely right. So that's why I think like in, yeah. in overall, like is the amount of money they're giving away a good idea? And is yeah. the mechanism, is the overall idea of a retroactive goods funding program for optimism relative to their competitors good? It's a great idea. Clearly, clearly it has worked in winning over Mindshare, took over Twitter for what, two weeks essentially. Yep. Uh, so if you're an L2 or in such starting up and you're not doing one at this point, like our optimism is going to continue to fund credibility. Are they, you know, credibility in favor? If they're, if they, maybe they're overpaying for it, but they are, they are doing that one way or another, right? Yes. Yes. I, I agree with that point. And I think just to actually state it, the one thing I noticed that I, I kind of disagreed with, with some of the people who are pushing back on well-funded venture companies getting funding is that. Some of those companies do have very generous free tiers that in a lot of cases are how people start using optimism or base or whatever, whether it's some of the RPC providers or whoever, but I don't know. It's super interesting program. And uh, I think maybe we get to be a badge holder since we got one this time. I'm not sure. I, I forget how it works, but I'll be excited to vote next time if I can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, you know, the participation is great as well. The debate's great. Um, I think. Overall, the 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 more that people spend, uh, the more time people spend on trying to make this program better, will like will will in fact actually amount to something. Maybe the existing version isn't it, but I do think that for a whole slew of reasons, like we talked about, that on the net, it's it's a nice initiative, and, and it make makes sense as, even from a business standpoint for what Optimism is trying to achieve. Okay, so I do have one last question, but you've inspired me with with one other question here that I want to ask, which is. Across the entire L2 ecosystem, you guys are on eight, going to 14, change with Oku. How do you see the L2 ecosystem today? Like, do you envision this world of many, many chains or how do you see no, it? I, I don't, I don't. I don't think the way in which chains look today is what it will be. Maybe a year from now it will be because like it just, these stuff, the stuff does take a time to change. But the idea that we'll have this many chains that users will regularly have to go between three years from now doesn't sound like particularly likely to me uh unless we're moving more towards like the app chain thesis where like these some of these chains become like one's particularly gaming driven one ft driven but even that to me seems rather unlikely i mean ethereum is still very much the king uh totally. and like beyond that like after ethereum everyone's still kind of jockeying for position i think 
there's you know BSE has certainly found its you know its niche for itself as well as much as it doesn't really get talked about in the states that they are a gigantic chain and have the most users. But beyond that, I would say the L2s are all very much up for grabs. The winner, you know, the king has not been crowned yet. It's going to be a while. Totally. Yeah. One of the things that kind of stands out to me in the L2 ecosystem is that I, I just did this very rough analysis recently, but on most L2s today, there are no significant native apps. Like I think even on Optimism, the largest native application is Velodrome. I think. Yeah, you have like Velodrome and Optimism, Camelot yeah. on Arbitrum. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we're missing some, but yeah. GMX on Arbitrum was the one exception of oh, a big yeah, app. Oh yeah, GMX as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, it, it hasn't, you know, you don't have the same killer kind of uh, system yet. I, that being said, like it's covered yeah. across chain bar land. That will not be built on Ethereum. Like no matter what, that will not be built on Ethereum. It'll exist on Ethereum and as far as like you can borrow land from it, but the core protocol will get built on one of these L2s. So I think like it, it, it's coming on these things. And of course, like the gaming projects are moving across these chains yep. as well. That makes a lot of sense. Zora making its own chain is quite interesting, but yeah, it's, we'll see. All right. Well, final question as we're coming to the end, we've talked about a bunch of different topics, interfaces, crushing bar land, L2s. Outside of some of the things you're working on directly, um, what other technological or business go-to-market developments do you think will have kind of the biggest impact in the next few years here? Oh, that's a great question. I would say there are some companies who are working on bringing equities, commodities, and um, securities on chain. This to me is the most interesting thing over the next kind of six, 24 months. Uh, that mm. to me will be like the true catalyst for like the next wave of DeFi and crypto innovation is like when we bring these traditional markets and RWAs more widely on chain. I want every single stock in the S&P 500 tokenized and I want every major ETF available on chain. I want trade to them on Oku. Yeah, yeah, trade them on Oku. I want to be arguing about them on MakerDAO and like what is Berkshire Hathaway's reasonable collateral ratio while we have, you know, Tesla's collateral as well and everything else. Like the discourse and conversation and the problem set to me becomes so much more interesting and relevant as we shift into like more tangible assets the, you know, we can't trade meme coins and governance tokens forever. I, it, and I, I think most people recognize that it's just a matter of like, do we get the regulation and legislation that allows us to do it? And it, it will come eventually. It's just, it's going to take time, but that is the thing that I'm like most excited for. And it, it will come eventually. Yeah. I think the other camp would be that, you know, you see crypto assets start to converge and have more cash flow type properties of things like equities, but perhaps the regulatory environment holds us back and maybe it's easier through other jurisdictions to bring some of those other things on chain. And yeah. I mean, I think a lot of what I just described can be done today. You know, the, the, the folks in Hong Kong and the stock exchange over there are being fairly innovative. They certainly are in Switzerland as well. Uh, and some of these other um, nations that are outside the States that are, are really more innovative. Granted, most people are most interested by the blue chip stocks in the States, but you know, that's also probably my American view of being like, okay, well, there's obviously other things out there. We shouldn't just, you know, think about all the large American companies. There's clearly a world greater than us. Let's tokenize and get those on his chain as well. I mean, heck, most of Oku's users are from outside of the United States. You know, it's only mm. like 20%, 25% Americans. So what about all of them? Let's get them their favorite companies on chain and their, their investments and, you know, broaden their horizons. Getty, thank you very much for all the time today. I definitely enjoyed the conversation. I hope all of our listeners did as well. And, yeah, uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Talk to you soon.